in this video we're going to make a historically accurate belt for early medieval period or dark age reenactment. That's coming up. G'day everyone, my name is Ben and welcome to Medieval Mayhem. On this channel you'll find lots of videos into the whole medieval period. You'll find reviews into other people's gear, you'll find crafting videos into making your own costumes, you'll find DIY videos into making your own furniture, you'll find how-to videos into all sorts of medieval camping and that kind of thing. We do videos for, we analyse historical events, what happened, who were the key players and why did things turn out the way that they did. So if medieval is your thing, this is the channel for you and you might want to consider subscribing. Radio. so today we're going to make a, um, a fairly historically accurate Dark Age style belt. So what do we know about Dark Age belts? Well, we know from grey finds and depictions and in, in some cases uh, from the iconography of the time uh, that belts were in fact a great deal narrower than most people think they are today. So in today, when we look at uh, movies and TV shows and that kind of thing, we see all kinds of weird and wonderful, basically uh, fantasy type armor, I guess, or uh, belts that are incredibly wide, which just would never have been worn by people in the actual dark ages themselves. So uh, having done some good research, I've uh, come up with these couple of buckles Bear in mind that um, there's not a lot of stuff that's readily available just at the moment due to the lockdown and everything else, so uh, I'm just sort of working with what I can get. However, um, belts were actually relatively long. They typically went down to sort of somewhere around knee length, um, and they had an actual, if you like, a fairly modern style buckle with a... Uh, a metal tag at the end of the belt. So I'm deliberately not using all of the sort of technical terms at the moment um, because I like to try and appeal to a, um, a wider range of the audience. Uh, this belt is going to be just under 20 millimeters wide. So what's that? Um, roughly three quarters of an inch, I guess. I'm not the most um, awesome person at imperial measurements. Okay. Uh, now, what else are you going to need? You're going to need some vegetable tanned leather. I tend to find belts that are around about two and a half millimeters thick, pretty much ideal for this. Bear in mind that you're going to need to double the, the thickness of the belt when it comes to the buckle, and therefore stitching can be a bit of a problem. I don't like to use rivets. Um, rivets were not that historically accurate. Uh, let me see. Um, and I tend to find that a, a thicker belt, as in two and a half millimeters thick, doesn't tend to roll as easily. So when you're carrying a pouch and axe and coins and all that kind of stuff, um, your belt actually starts to pick up a bit of weight and therefore um, I don't really want it rolling. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into the build. Right, so the first thing I usually start off my projects with is just beveling the edge of the products. So what this does is provides you with a nice smooth finish. You'll notice quite possibly that um, some of the commercial ones don't do this and it's a bit disappointing, especially when you consider how much you can pay for medieval type belts. Alrighty, so these bevelers don't cost much money. You're really looking at, um, oh, I don't know, eight or nine dollars or something. They're not much at all. And you can get them from a lot of the
uh, online stores and you can pay decent money for them if you prefer to do so. I do both sides of the belt because people are going to see both sides. And it just gives you a really nice oops, bit of a finish there. Alrighty. And there is really quite a difference when you look at um, uh, products that have been beveled and ones that haven't. Now I built this narrow. I don't, I'm not going to do very much tooling or anything like that decoration wise to it. Uh, that is actually going to be displayed in the things that are going to go on the belt. So obviously remember that medieval people didn't have the luxury of pockets. So everything that they had or that they needed for their day typically went either in a bag over their shoulder or something, perhaps in a basket or on their belt. So the stuff that they would have needed on their belt would have consisted of maybe uh, a small knife called a sax, perhaps an axe, coin purse, a pouch with some of the sort of daily items that they may prefer to have with them. And this changed across the, uh, the medieval period. So we tend to see a lot of items being hung from people's jewellery in the, uh, the earlier medieval period, commonly referred to as the Dark Ages. And then we tend to see things like um, uh, these sorts of things tending to disappear by uh, the 8th or 9th century. Things did change definitely and it changed on the geographical area that, uh, you're particularly looking at. So for example, and this is quite important, a, a Scandinavian settler that some people may call a Viking would have been quite different if they were in uh, England versus somewhere like uh, Sweden or what is now today Sweden. Different again perhaps in what is today Norway different again in uh, modern day Denmark. And remember that national borders have changed a lot over the period of time. Now the next thing that I'm going to do is burnish the edges. You can get mechanical burnishing tools. Um, I've even seen people make their own. Uh, I personally don't really do enough leather work just at the moment to really justify that. So, I may come back and revisit that a bit later on, but just for the moment, I don't mind doing it by hand, and there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Alright, so what we're using here is beeswax. I got this particular one, uh, I'll leave a link in the description below. I believe it was uh, Medieval Fight Club in Australia. Uh, although you can source these lumps of beeswax fairly readily from craft shops and hobby stores, uh, even some hardware stores. Okay. Now um, we use a, a burnishing tool. You can pick these up for about $5 online. Um, and they have different edges and different surfaces depending on the one you buy. Um, what burnishing does, just briefly I guess, is that it um, finishes the edges and helps protect them from the weather but it gives them um, just a really magnificent sheen I guess to the to the edge once it's been burnished properly. It does take a little while and this is obviously a fairly big piece of, you know, a fairly long piece of leather. There's a fair bit of surface area to cover. 
So this will take a while and you need to give yourself a little bit of time to do that. But that's okay. I don't think anyone's in too much of a rush here. So how about we come back in a few minutes once I've um, got this burnishing done. So you pretty much, you'd need to cover the hole, obviously, both sides. Alright, so with the burnishing now complete, what I'm going to look at now is just setting up the holes for the hardware. Alright, so just a couple of things we'll mention when it comes to hardware. Alright, so number one, um, I like to pre-punch all my holes. Now you want to use uh, quality fit finishings and fittings when you uh, where you can. So on the other side of the belt, we're just going to work out how this is going to work. So I want to have two rows of stitching because I don't want anything. I just find that a bit more secure. What we're doing just here And now I'm just going to do a quick little test just to make sure everything's going to fit. There we go, perfect. Before I put everything into place, I'm just going to go across with the die and um, the sealer. So I tend to wear a latex glove when I'm using leather dies. I just find that works a little better for me. Not everybody does, that's okay. Now I'm using a dark brown leather die from a company called Mac Lace Leather. Now I'm going to be doing both sides of the leather. Uh, some people I've noticed use cotton balls and stuff. I like to use these little sponge things. They've got a nice little handle on them. You can get these from craft shops pretty cheaply. Uh, you may wish to use more than one application of dye. Depends on the type of dye you're using and how dark you want it to be or how light. That's okay. Uh, and then I dyed both sides of the leather because people are going to see both sides of the leather. Leather dye doesn't take long to dry because it obviously gets absorbed into the leather. I know some people use uh, acrylic paints and stuff as well. Uh, I'm not such a fan of acrylic paints. I, I do use them occasionally, I must admit. Um, but it depends on, I guess, what you're using it for. So the right product for the right application uh, is always a good goal. This doesn't take long at all, as you can see. Um, once your leather dye has dried, I like to use a leather sealer, clear leather sealer. This particular one is again from Mac Lace. Uh, I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Uh, what uh, this does is it just gives you uh, a little bit of protection from UV light and moisture damage, which obviously you're going to get in, I guess, a lot of reenactment events, whether that's through perspiration or just weather. Once again, it doesn't take long at all to dry. Alrighty, so now we're going to put the buckle under the belt. Uh, so everything's preset, ready to go. The dry and the sealer are, sorry, the dye and the sealer are drying off. I use a blunt needle. 
with a waxed linen thread. Now I know some people use stitching ponies, I know some people use just two needles, I know uh, there's some, some crazy stuff getting around out there. Um, I'm a simple guy, I like simple things, so I'm just going to do this in a very simple way. Um, I just make a very small knot, you don't need anything fantastic. So we're going to start on one side here. Now I'm going to leave the knot in the middle. That's fine, we can, we can trim that out. Now I just use a simple running stitch. Okay, and we go from, I guess, one side of the project to the other. Okay. Now what we should end up with is something that's going to look a lot like this. Now what I'm going to do is do pretty much the exact opposite and just sew back in the other direction. Okay. So, now on each side that is going to look like this. We're just going to zoom in a little bit here. Alrighty, so just zooming in so we can all see. So that's, that's pretty much now what we've got, okay? So this is one straight continuous line. This looks a lot like a saddle stitch uh, or a back stitch is a, uh, another very comparable stitch. Uh, and it's incredibly effective. So we're gonna do two rows of that and that's gonna be pretty much our stitching done. Now we've got our two rows of stitching. That's how I do leather stitching, uh, especially for small projects like this. That's fine. It's, it's reasonably quick. This has taken me less than five minutes with changes to the camera and that's all squared away and done. So I'm really happy with that. Um, and it's an incredibly strong stitch. Now all I need to do is just to trim off the ends. For that, you can just use a blade uh, or a pair of scissors or whatever you've got and a cigarette lighter. Now, um, this was a waxed linen thread, so what that means is the thread will melt, and there you go, done. I'm really happy with that. Really the last thing on our belt is the, the rivet. I think the main tip is to do one rivet at a time, and just to figure out how you want it to look, Try and use rivets that are pretty soft and don't use rivets that are longer than necessary. So really you're trying to aim just to secure that uh, the rivet into the leather. You don't need it to be crazy long or anything like that. You just need it to do the job it needs to do. Uh, and so uh, you can just trim them to suit. All right, so just trim off your excess. Now you want everything else to be as tight as possible and not move. This is basically where everyone goes wrong, including myself. Um, and, and I stress I'm not an expert in this, but um, if you can pretty much prevent any movement, you're going to prevent 
much going wrong because that's where the little um, bits of brass will snap off your buckle and then you've wasted uh, um, your money or you're going to have to find a way to attach new hardware to your buckle in order to use it. Alrighty, and that is basically how to pin a rivet. You want, this is the finish that you're looking for. The washers or the, the rings need to be nicely secured in place. You don't want too much excess on the rivet, which is gonna cause the, um, the, the breakages and that kind of stuff. You just want enough just to get you uh, a nice secure purchase on that washer. There we go, guys. I really hope that uh, that helps. Any other questions, please leave a comment below. I'll try and get to you as soon as I can. Alrighty, guys, um, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. I'll catch you in my next video. Now, the only other thing to think about really is going to be holes in the belt for where you want your buckle to go. So, for me, uh, I have measured the belt. And I'm just going to drop a couple of holes in. Nice simple project can save you a fortune and it is the kind of fundamentals or the foundation for a really good uh, historical impression. There we go guys, um, thank you. This has come out really, really, really well. I'm so happy with it. Belt is uh, it's nice and long. You got a lot of color to it. It's got a good, good, um, good surface to it. It's nice finish, I'm super, super happy. I really hope you got something out of today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.